were together. And then I was in New York, and it was Frank. Me one anecdote only. Who approached me and said, uh, I've seen that house you designed, and we have to get it published. And I said, I'm busy writing about other things. I need to get it published. He said, No, no, no. I insist that we'll pull together a few people. Uh, I know a kid named uh, Leap Skin who draws like a whiz and it'd be cheap. And, uh, and he's under 20. And so Frank took it upon himself to draw up. Make a set of beautiful drawings uh, with Dana's help. Uh, and that's one of the memories I have of the beginning of our friendship. So much of what architects do involve explanations. Because most who have the financial power to build need to believe that there is a connection between what they want and what they can afford. And further, that convenience, which is something they jealously understand, is not to be sacrificed to an antagonistic aesthetic idea promoted by the architect and rationalized by obscure language. Often the language becomes a substitute for the thing itself because of the necessity of practical accommodation and the means employed to satisfy the eye, though not in principle antagonistic, become so because of the need to explain. In the process, what is to be built is judged in terms of the language used to examine issues of practical necessity and critical procedures to evaluate aesthetic intentions are either thereby compromised or become so detached from issues of use as to constitute a separate intellectual practice altogether. A practice which, in the extreme, begins to shape aesthetic choices themselves, producing architecture without institutional memory or a location in place or time. What is gained in radical force is lost in breadth of communication calling into question the social basis of architecture and consigning its products to a narrow market niche where like believers, armed for the truth, operate at the margins. It is also possible, though rare, for a mature and ample talent, informed by sociable common sense and ingenuity, flourish and even to be liberated by a most complete identification with time and place. And from that engagement to enjoy the role of the architect in society with a decent respect for where the boundaries of communication may lie. And from this reticence to achieve still greater precision and intensity of emotion. An artist does not choose to identify with contemporary place and time, but is rather compelled to do so. If qualified by a generosity of spirit, that talent may also listen for memory to speak, for the voice of Wright and Schindler to be heard, as well as Gary, and others now and before through the fragmented diversity and collage of our present moment, exemplified by Los Angeles its anti-narrative, discontinuous multiplicity, its simultaneous, competing, non-hierarchical, ambiguous, porous, void positive, temporary, tentative, malleable condition, where everything which is solid melts into air. One response to this predicament is to stabilize the spirit with sensuous attention to detail, strategy employed in cinema where the ordinary is given a sudden uncanny presence by a change in scale or color, for example, and the passage through time is intensified and at the same moment arrested, held back from loss. The work of tonight's speaker may be understood as an unforced armature supporting a spaced arrangement of these intense, autonomous, differentiated moments. It may also be understood as deriving from our natural setting, the scale of mountain, plain, and sea, augmented by the visual impact of freeway topography, the urban incremental, 
in contest with vast reaches of space and sky, with disruptions of natural surface and volume measured in the tens and tens of miles. These find their architectural correlative in the extended, folded planes uniting elevation and roof and the intended discontinuities of scale which are thereby introduced into the composition. This work, in a phrase of Keats, does not irritably reach after facts and has made its peace with uncertainties. Thus, through art, does the humane spirit, without despair and isolation, operate on the most elusive and discomforting culmination of the present, which is Los Angeles, and without sacrifice to memory, local inspiration, or truth, arrive at an architecture which affirms the pleasure of seeing and the possibilities of the conditional, the changing, and the open. Franklin, Israel. Minneapolis, where his father was a pretty prominent entrepreneur, 
for it. And then he moved to Los Angeles, and he worked at MGM as a sound engineer. And then he bought a food company, Bite of Products it was called. And then after that, he expanded, and he became the director of Hunt Foods, which is a very large company. And he invested in, a, in an uranium plant that proved to be very successful. <laughs> and eventually, he bought this company, which runs 120 distributors. They distribute automobiles and trucks, mostly trucks. And the main building was this building in Glen Burnie. And he commissioned Frank because he felt the building was boring and there were offices, office facilities right here. That's, that's offices, the rest of this court. To design the offices and Frank put these pods out in front of the building here. And then he called him up after the project had been done and said, we're expanding. Well, Frank was very busy, so he gave him some names and we got the job in the interview. The project actually expanded and became the double size for storage, but the big issue was where the office is. Frank had no idea it was going to turn into such a large project. Of course, we didn't know. But um, it did become a large project. This is the original, and then this is the addition that we did, and the storage facility is right behind it. And Fred was fascinating because the issue here, which was so important to him, was to try to maintain the integrity of the Geary original. And that's what we attempted to do in our design, and that was the one thing that he was emphatic about that all the meetings we went to. Well, years later, we got to do a building for him. And uh, it's a building that's solely a stone's throw from campus, right on Carrollwood Drive, which is on the hills. And it's a little uh, kind of private museum. Well, we call it the Lodge of Pavilion. He had a house where his, his major collection of art sat. He has um, the Curicos and the Casos, a pretty, pretty formidable collection. And he had some larger paintings, which he couldn't fit in that house. So the program initially started with a gallery space that you see in this section here. And it expanded into offices for his, his foundation which sponsors conferences, and also uh, a guest house for visiting artists, which is at an intermediary level. Well, the building grew out of a conversation, a dialogue that we had. Fred had just come back from uh, Japan, he was exhibiting his, his um, graphic collection, graphic designs, uh, all over the country. and. Um, he had visited the Katsura Palace and he said, I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Shah of Iran, when he went to uh, uh, Harvard and visited the Harvard Medical Center, he decided he wanted one of those, too. And I was living in Iran at the time. And uh, it was a pretty awesome challenge to try to re recreate something like that. But Fred was much more realistic. He started collecting art with his wife, Marcia Wiseman, his first wife. And they became formidable collectors. Uh, if you've been to Cedar sinai all the art that you see there, which is pretty impressive, always is a collection that Marcia's put together. And Fred began to create museums, not this private one, but museums. He has one at Pepperdine. He has one out in uh, Minneapolis that Frank Gehry designed. And uh, he's actually bequeathed a lot of art to the museum in San Diego. This was supposed to be a private place. At one point, Frank said to me, you know, Frank, I'd like to be buried here. But, it, you know, we, we explored that possibility. And said, no, it's not possible. But this was a project that grew out of a, another project that I actually took Fred to see. And he was charmed immediately by this lady. Her name is Michelle Ami. And she had hired us to do a little pavilion. She bought this house in Hancock Park near her daughter's school. And she painted the house. That's the, the sort of platform house that you see here. And she wanted something that was more 
reminiscent of a studio. One day she called me and she said, I know exactly what I want. I want an apart, an apart, a Parisian apartment, the kind that you see those two-story things on, on the boulevard saint Germain. And as a result, we created this studio. Uh, this is the front of the building. Uh, her husband was an artist. You know, I've talked about this before. He did weird things like buried himself under the front lawn. <laughs> but Michelle, who um, is one of our clients who is now divorced, <laughs> she followed through with a particular concept that that was inspirational. And one day she said to me, you know what, I, there's this house I want to take you to see. So we got in the car and we drove out to Santa Monica Canyon and it was the Eames house. She said, I really like this. It's very, she said, it reminds me of, of the, the uh, Maison de Air. And uh, she was a very sophisticated client. She still is. Great restaurant owner at the moment. But what you need to know about Michelle is that she was a lawyer. Uh, she was a filmmaker. She produced two films of Jean Luc Godard's, one of them was one King. And as a result, her visual sensibilities helped us create this particular project. But getting back to Wiseman, there were issues that Fred was very concerned about. One was what to do about the street, because a lot of people are going to see this building. And he was concerned that the building not stand out too much. So we tend to put this, this roof on it. It was my first and only tonight. I hope I don't have to do another one. <laughs> but we came up with a clever way of covering it up in the rear through this, this parapet. Um, the other issue was the site. The site, as you, if you remember from the section, steps down very dramatically. The street level is up here, and it drops down into this ravine. And Fred felt it was important to do a building that celebrated the site and use that direction <coughs> once. So the building has a two-sided sense to it, one which is somewhat public, which deals with colors and materials that are particular to this, to this area. Fred didn't want to offend his neighbors. And then another side, which is the garden side, which is much more dramatic. <coughs> this shows the uh, balcony, which was kind of a folly. I was standing on the site with him and his, his future wife, Billy, one day. And they were looking out, and they said, wouldn't it be exciting to um, think about this as a great arc, as a kind of art barn or an arc? And, be able to lower people down, up and down into the garden. So we created this boat, which doesn't lower up and down into the garden. It's too hard to do, but it does have that symbolic meaning or reference of sorts. The inside of the gallery is a large barn with recessed lighting. And, and Fred was very insistent that we not use skylights. Well, actually, it was more Billy, because she used to work at the museum off, uh, which was insistent that skylights always leaked. The corner windows, which he actually had seen at, Le, at the Lemay project, was also an idea for Ed because he said he likes to hang art everywhere and he can't do it in corners, so wouldn't that be the right place for the windows? He was actually a like astute client and had a lot to do with the, the design of this building. The stair was something that um, drew out a conversation we had about a boat stair that he remembered. And he and Billy had gone on a cruise together, and they had seen this, this ship's ladder, and in fact had taken some pictures of it. So we sort of took that as a point of view. It felt the stair more like a toe. It sort of feels like someone's leaning their toe and stepping down. Okay. After we finished that project, I got a phone call from these two guys. That's Jim and Howard, Jim Bean and Howard Goldberg. And they had hired an architect who, in the true tradition of architecture, had gone bankrupt. <laughs> and because he had gone bankrupt, he couldn't finish the working room, so they had to start over again. Now they owned this, this little bungalow that you see it here, up in the Hollywood Hills. And they wanted to add on 
And they had hired this gentleman to add on to it, and they were at the point where they thought the project was going to have minutes to stop. So we had the opportunity to revitalize it. And the input of their involvement really had much to do with the stylistics of the building, but also, in some ways, the functional, functional aspects of it, too. Uh, Howard was someone who liked homey, comfortable spaces, and Jim was into very severe modern architecture and very slick uh, and sleek design. So the question was, well, how do you reconcile these, these two gentlemen who are living together and, of course, care about each other very much, but have very different tastes in life? So what we developed was a strategy, and it had to do with designing a wall, which links various public aspects of the project, the living room, the entrance gallery, the stair, which goes up to Howard's study above, and then a shower, which is also in that house, a fairly public place, which is off today. Um, what you see here is the, the building itself, which is a series of pieces that define an edge. And these pieces are the bedroom, the living room with the kitchen, and then the guest area. The living room here is a very sleek, modern part of the house. And it contains the kitchen, which is where Jim spent all his time, is pretty cook. The bedroom, which was Howard's own, is cozy and, in its own way, very remote. It feels as if it's, you're somewhere else, which is what he wanted. He's a, he was a uh, an outstanding agent in the uh, entertainment business. And when he went home, he wanted to feel like as if he was far away. So you have this part of the house, which is fairly rigid and, and simple and severe, with, with sliding glass doors that open up to this garden, which you'll see in the photographs. The kitchen, so that was in zone. The bedroom and office up above the second level, which is Howard zone. And this area was designed with a certain degree of, of rigor. And this area ha happens to be much softer and less hard edge. Finally, the wall links the two. This is the exterior, the front, and a, few, uh, a view into the garden through this garden gate. Bedroom which wraps around just uh, sheath and metal. Um, does anyone can focus these a bit? And are they focused? Yeah. Can you fo uh, can we focus these better? Yeah. Now you can see all the dirt. Um, Color again was something, you know, Howard liked uh, reds and, and yellows and Jim liked blues. Um, so sort of went with the primary palette, was more of that inside. This is the front door. The bedroom is like a giant like, tree house. It's like a balcony and Howard's office up above. The fireplace that sits in the master bedroom. With a series of corner windows, and a trellis which is covered with uh, exterior. And then the garden and this edge, the house feels as if it's, well, at least the land feels as if it's falling over an edge. And a series of planters that Jay Griffith designed for us, plants that are dead in the outdoor fireplace where the two of them would get together in their various zones. Inside, the entry sequence starts through this wall, which is pigmented plaster and glue. Pulls you in, concrete floor, into the living room. The living room is, in fact, engaged in this surface, which mediates between the kitchen and breakfast area and the living space. The wall follows itself through and carries you into the bedroom. There are sliding doors on either side. They open up, so the bedroom really becomes part of the gallery space. 
the stair which takes you up into Howard's domain. You want a private place in which you can see Hollywood from far away from it. His office, which looked out at his picture window, and that was his zone. And this is Jim's zone, the very slick and modern or modern kitchen with its uh, soup machine. Everyone has that one. Well, one day we were finishing this project, and these two guys, or this girl and guy, came down the street. And they had been watching the progress of the house, and they said, you know, we live right down the street, and we really think what you're doing is fairly neat. They said, you know, we met on a street corner in Soho, in New York. This is Marla and Wesley Sprick. And uh, they lived in a loft and they, in New York City. Actually, they corrected me the other day. They said we lived in a sleazy apartment in the East Village, and then we moved into a loft. <laughs> Well, they own this house, which was about half a block below the Boulder Feeding House. And it was a house that had been built by Dick Tanny. He's a, you know, he's a Texas husband. And they wanted to build a third floor, which would be a loft space for them. They were there with their two kids. And Wesley had just made it big. He had just written Batman Returns. They get it, you know. Marla just opened a store out in Ventura Boulevard. She sells old furniture. And they wanted a space that would be a bedroom, living room, bathroom, place to watch TV with the kids, and actually one space. So that's what we did. We designed a space which starts sequentially from a door which pivots open along the radius, pulls you in into this bedroom, living room. And finally ends at that door, which leads to a terrace, which looks out at a spectacular view of the city. This shows the, the sort of interactive aspect of the space, the shower, the jacuzzi pool you see here, the uh, double stakes, uh, the mirror, and then the television, which we look at in the bedroom, is just behind the space. <coughs> with a sliding glass window that slides down so it in fact opens up the terrace in the view of the city. Well, I've had other clients who are not necessarily you know, involved in residential work. Uh, these three guys are film producers. Actually, he's a director. And what was unique about their project was a studio called Tish Abbott Films. This is Steve Tish, that's John Abbott, and that's Jordan Kerner. It was that they were all in the throes of having problems with their wives. It was unique in Hollywood, especially him. And they wanted to design an office that they felt they could go to and be in their own world, away from home. So that was the beginning. <laughs> But there were certain problems because they're not going to work there by themselves. They're working there with about 100 people. And um, those people had needs too. So what we did was we, we basically dealt with the project to, to, on two levels. One which was, was a series of offices, three offices for these three guys, all of whom collect art, all of whom, or each of whom has very different tastes from the others. And then the collective zone, which is the zone where the people who work there cohabitate and get together. The project is in a building in Culver City. It's one of the only buildings in Culver City. Uh, no redeeming features. Um, because I got the job because I told them it, 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 it could be, you know, it was redeemable. <laughs> 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 uh, there's an entrance which is three stories high. The main level is on this, this uh, second level here. And there's a collective space on that main level, the second level, which is, a, which is formed by this arc. And then there's a conference room, which is a, also a, a two-story hut. I would not say almost three-story hut. The entrance you see here, which is fairly dramatic, uh, leads you up 
and you go up an elevator actually behind the yellow wall, and then you're in this area where you sit in this class floor, and then you come into the you come into this collective area, which is where the office has its meetings. They uh, assemble everyone in that space. It was a very important part of the project. They believe in dialogue. <laughs> and then they decide what they're going to do. They decide it anyway. Um, one of the things that, that John wanted more than anything was a conference room that no one would ever forget. So we designed this conference room with these walls that actually pinched together. I wanted them to move, but that was very expensive. <laughs> That, you, know, you know, they should be able to control whether or not you get to see the sky. If, you're, if the meaning's going well. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see from this image on the screen, the meeting isn't going well. <laughs> but the public zone of the, of the building is very different from the private zone. These two slides show Steve's office. Now, Steve's a very sophisticated um, man. He uh, collects art with the passion. And he wanted his his space to, in fact, he said, I want it to feel like like Germany during the war. <laughs> so we kind of projected his shadows and <laughs> colored the space in the sort of orange green, designing these lights that hang and feel somewhat nostalgic. And this doorway is a double door. This is the outside going in. And inside of the house. It's a 2,500 pieces of stack glass inspired by Mitchell Tejanet. He's in the place. And then we had two other spaces to deal with. Now, Steve is very sophisticated. He collects art. You know, he goes to New York. He goes to swap meets. You know, he's not a titch. So. And he likes very, um, he likes arts and crafts, as you can see from this space, the you know, colors. And John actually has an incredible collection of Henry Moore's. He has a, and he also has a wonderful, uh, um, there's a series of mobiles too that are now hanging in that space. And the colors really grew out of the dialogue we had with each one of these gentlemen. Um, the, Irving Couch, Gordon was a little concerned that he wouldn't be able to be particularly seductive on that couch. But we kind of pulled this out later on and it became deeper. And John wanted leather because he felt that it was more mature. <laughs> so it's an interesting project, and it's a project that actually still works very well. It's like there are stuff. Lots of stuff. Up. You know, Steve just was nominated for an Oscar for Boris Johnson. John directed the second movie, I think it's called The War, with Kevin Costner recently. And they're doing interesting work. They have, they have a lot of integrity to do. Okay, you know, he's this guy. He almost became our mayor. And he actually works in Westwood, and that's his wife. That's Mike Wu and Susan Fong. And they're standing on a piece of turf in this idyllic setting, which we would wish was their backyard. But their backyard feels like Phoenix is just desolate. They haven't built a farm yet. But they have this house, and the house is in Silver Lake. And it was one of those houses that didn't have a view of the lake. And they wanted a view of the lake, and they wanted a new bedroom, and they wanted a few guest bedrooms. So what we did was we assembled the project, which is in a series of parts. Parts. There's an entrance with a trellis piece that sits over the garage. And there's an existing house, which became a place for Michael's books. He has a lot of books, like everywhere. And a lot of art, you know, they stack their paintings on top of his wall. And finally, a bedroom with a view out towards Silver Lake, because Susan felt frustrated. She said, we're living right near the lake, and we didn't even see it. So we came up with a solution to build this pavilion in the back. Now, the pavilion uh, is a piece that's 
very different from the building in the front, which is essentially, or was essentially, a rectilinear bungalow. Uh, I can't say that Mike had, or Susan had a lot to do with the physical manifestation of this project, even though their clients, they paid for it. They came to us and they said they wanted something that was uniquely Californian. They wanted something that perpetuated the tradition of California modernism. Well, that's, that's a real challenge. So in fact, it had a lot to do with the manifestation of what happened. There is an entry here, a kind of diagonal that pulls you through, and then finally, it actually pops around up a stair. The building, the pavilion, this new addition, is actually uh, shaped kind of like an S. Brings you up the stair to the second level, and a sleeping loft which looks out towards the hills, and then twists around and brings you into the master bedroom with its great view of the Silver Lake. We think we achieved what Mike and Susan wanted. This shows a sequence of entrance. The stair up, the trellis of entrance pieces is a place where they sit outside and eat because the kitchen is here and it spills out onto a roof terrace here. Then the stair sequences up through, uh, out towards a sleeping loft and then finally down into the uh, master bedroom. There are two bedrooms below. This shows the building. This is the first project that we started dealing with a series of folded planes. And I wasn't really aware that we were doing that until Dagmar Richard came to the office of Europe and said, oh, we're doing folded planes. And Annie, <laughs> she and I said, oh, yeah, we're doing folded planes. <laughs> you, know, I, 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 you know, the work that I'm showing, and, and even though this is a lecture about the planes, you know, the, the next lecture is going to be about my, my office and the people who work there. because. Uh, Barbara Callis and Annie Chu and Stephen Shortridge and David Spinelli and Michael Lucchini and Sarai Grinnell are really our staff and rich workers. And they are incredibly important. And architecture is about collective effort, it's not about one person. It's impossible. Like film, in that respect, it's a lot of performance. So this became a a, a kind of volume that sits floating in this space, which feels like the desert, which is supposed to be filled with plants. They tell me they're going to plant the garden. And this is the piece that pulls actually as a sleeping loft. And it came from a conversation that we had with Mike about the Schindler house. He, he's very sophisticated. And he said, you know, I like that sleeping loft the Schindler house, but you know, what happens when it rains? So we actually gave him a enclosed sleeping loft. And then this is the giant window that looks out at the corner of the glass piece that looks out towards Silver Lake and the jungle. This shows the sleeping loft and the stair which winds itself up towards that space and has a series of skylights that cut through the slot. Now, would you believe these are two doctors? Well, they are. Um, he operates on people and he sits in the emergency room and says that ER, if you've ever watched it, is not real. The way it really is. And you're sitting in, against a garden wall in this house where they lived for, I think, about 15 years. And it's in the Berkeley Hills. And we didn't design it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it burned down in the Berkeley fire, and uh, they went off to work one day. He was operating on people, and he was going to a meeting, and they came home, and there was nothing left. Everything was gone. They had two kids were in school, thank God. And it burned down a couple years ago. The house that they lived in, this original house, was kind of a tower. It's a pseudo Berkeley Hills tower, completely surrounded by foliage. And we had a mutual friend, Sharon and I. Uh, it was a friend of mine I actually met in Berkeley, ironically, in the, in the 60s when I was a baby. And uh, we were all hippies in the 60s. She was one too. And uh, <laughs> our 
mutual friend who lives in New York introduced us. Sharon was looking for an architect, and she was a little nervous at first because we were from Los Angeles. <laughs> people in the Bay Area are very suspect of people from Los Angeles. You know that. But she liked it because Sharon's a very daring person. And she likes taking risks. So we got the job. We built their house. And we started with a particular idea. Houses on a very steep site, as you see in this model. And Sharon said to me one day, she said, you know, that house we lived in for so many years had nothing to do with the site. You know, it could have been on a flat piece of land. So we started the dialogue with interest in designing a building that, in fact, engaged itself in the site and celebrated the fact that the site is as steep as it is. It's a long, longitudinal piece of land with not much space for on either side, and then this space in the back, which is less steep, and then it gets extremely steep, and there's a public park land. So what we did was we developed a plan in which the building steps up the hill, literally through a series of terraces. There are like four levels. And there is a stair that starts at the garage level and winds up this terrace level where a briar, that's her husband, and his son can play football, and they want to play football. That was the idea of this deck. They can throw a football from here to here. <laughs> but but the, kid, the, the kid, Troy, you know, these people, they need their kids. Probably. Troy is going to get big, and he's going to throw the football too far, and then have problems with the neighbors. Uh, and then the stair stops at that main level up above and becomes an element which, in fact, is engaged in the hill. We'll see that in the sections. Just out of the plans, the, the garage level, the storage room, it's exactly that. And then the stair gives you up. Gives you up to a family area. That's the mother-in-law's apartment. Sharon's mother will stay in prior will for go. The uh, main level of the house is here, the fireplace, the terrace looks out towards views of the bay. And then this stair, you come you actually you come up this way and then up again to the kitchen and the dining, and then you take the stair which follows itself up and ends at a plateau. And the bedroom level and the master bedroom returns to the front of the building with its views. This is the section again, the stair from the garage taking you up to this terrace level and then again up here to the living room and then up into the dining room. And finally, that this stair engages itself up and brings you out to the rear of the house, but also crosses over the bedrooms. In the elevations, but let's look at the building. The building situates itself in an area which is, if you sit up there, it's pretty amazing. Um, all these new houses going up, there's a, there's a uh, roof of the hotel building down the street. The family safe was doing something around right here, and then that's the bay. And when I was there recently, it wasn't so lush, and I felt I was in Phoenix, it was so barren. But we had problems because we were from Los Angeles and the people in the area were very suspect of us. And they still think they call it the Copper Dragon. <laughs> I'll show you what. I'll tell you what. Um, let's see. I want to just go back. Yeah, I want to just talk about the materials. What we did was we developed a palette of materials that I felt came out of Berkeley in the hills, in the tradition of the hills, copper and cedar and plaster, and this green stucco, and the glass tile. And we felt that we were trying to design a building that would blend in, and Aaron Betsky says it blends in. He says it blends in. This the building as it appears, the copper drag. The uh, terraces, this series of concrete and stucco walls, Series of openings. The building at night feels like a giant um, back lantern. The street elevation, the garage. These are Grant Mudford's photographs, almost all our, our photographs that you're seeing are by Grant. 
very beautiful. The, you know, the clouds broke open and it was a sunny day, part of the sunny day. The stair up to the main entrance, there's actually a main entrance, even though this is a Los Angeles house, everyone enters through the garage. But uh, you can still go up the stair and come into a foyer, which is right here. The copper, which is aging, it will take 20 years for it to turn green, which we don't want it to turn green. But well, it is. this is the front door over here, the side view, the hillside. The copper shingles. The stucco, which is a kind of greenish gray, it's hard to capture the color of it, but I think it's a good job. This is a side view looking out um, away from the city. And the rear of the building, which is completely different, you know, the scale changes radically. It's a little garden up there. You can see how the roof clips on to the building. Just finished. This is a stair which goes up from the entrance area, which has a view into the dining area. And this is a stair that follows the uh, the land and ends at this picture window with a door out towards the little garden. You can see the stair now going down with a balcony which wraps around, brings you to a study in the master bedroom. That's the one of the bedrooms for the kids. The stair is sort of bending, it's in a uh, somewhat uh, angular slot. Difficult to photograph. The, lower, uh, the ground level, uh, not the ground level, but the main level of the house is a living room with a fireplace and this wall. And this wall, I think it was probably the hardest wall we ever did. And we've done a lot of color, things with color. On, I got bored of it, but people wanted it, so they said we want it. And she wanted this wall, and she had this shoe. And it was a suede shoe, and she sent it to, to us in the mail. It was all dirty. And she said, I want my wall, and I want it to be this color. <laughs> so Barbara mixed the color, and she got it right, but then the contractor couldn't do it. We found someone else, and we mixed the color, and Annie went up there, and we gave her her purple wall. <laughs> this is Sharon's office. Fryer has an office downstairs, which is all green. And it feels like you're in a log cabin, because he's from Vermont. And it's extremely small. And he likes to lie on the floor and do yoga. And he wanted a room in which he would feel crunched in, because that's the way he said he felt when he grew up in Vermont. I don't have a picture of that, because it's so crunched in, you can't photograph it. <laughs> and of course, she wanted the, the open view, which looks down out towards the entrance and below towards the interior entry of the house. And um, is there a sense of control? And these are Nicholas Weinstein's sculptures, glass in front of glass, which are sun to the beautiful sculptures that we put in this photograph. And the master bedroom with its fireplace. And this is a slot which goes down to four, four levels. Excellent. Okay, now. What would you do if you met these clients? <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture from Life Magazine, and they live in Philadelphia. They're mainliners. You know, it's mainline. You know, if you live in Philadelphia, you live in mainline. And this is actually a Neutra house. It's a house in Philadelphia. Neutra designed for Jack and Annette Freeland when they were married. And they love this house even though they hired a very fashionable French decorator to come and redecorate it. I think he destroyed it. Tom Hines and Pudesley, gas. Well, they also own this piece of property in Florida, which is just north of my of um, Palm Beach, a place called Jupiter. It's one of the main things by George doesn't live there anymore. And they wanted a house that would be different from their Neutra house. That was very important. And that kept on saying, you know, we live in a Neutra house. We don't want to live in another Neutra house. We love our Neutra house. And 
they came to LA because they had heard that LA was where all the fashionable architects are. And they interviewed a lot of people. And one day, after maybe six months after the interview, Jack called and he said, I have bad news. I figured, well, it was us to hire us. He said, we're hiring you. <laughs> so we got hired and went to Florida and looked at this site, which is along the intercoastal. That's a waterway, and that's Jack's boat. We have the name of it. Even and the site is kind of muddy here. And there's a golf course out here, and the water's here. It's an ideal world for people who retire. They play golf, and then they take the boat. Jack doesn't like to fish, though. He just likes to go on the boat. And Annette, as you can see, she likes to have parties and get dressed up. <laughs> so it's a hard project to do. And we did two schemes. The first scheme, I'll show you. It's, uh, Series of walls that kind of bend around and create a series of, of, of kind of abstract rooms. These are sectional plans to the building. So I kind of want to, they're difficult to explain. But we designed this building finally because I was there for four days and it rained every day. It was stormy and cold. And my family lives in Florida. And at least my mother does now. And it gets pretty um, dreary at times. And that's what inspired this building, which has this wonderful metal roof, a lead coated copper roof, which wraps over these volumes, the master bedroom being here, the office for Jack being upstairs. You can see a section of the stair that takes you up from various levels. And at first, when they saw this project, they were thrilled. They, they just loved it and they were really excited. And then um, three days later, we were sitting in a restaurant and they said we have bad news we hate the house <laughs> and i said well what do you hate about it you told me three days ago you liked it he said it's too much too much roof <laughs> so we had to go back to the drawing boards and uh it wasn't thrilling but one of the things that I've been really interested in, in, in the work that we've done, and I know Annie and Barbara and the students feel the same way, is we want to build, we're not interested in building models, we're interested in making architecture, and it's a small project over here at UCLA that we did recently in the medical center, um, or if it's a little uh, storage facility for someone in central Los Angeles, you know, we're going to do it, and we want to just keep building it. So we decided that we would work and try to make them happy. And we have. The house is just starting construction. But it changed. It shows the uh, older house. You all are better. Except for Stephen. You know, Stephen. He's running this project. He feels very sensitive. This is a project that we designed to just change. It seems to have a lot of roof, don't you think? Uh, we fragmented the roof. And by fragmenting the roof, it seemed as if it wasn't quite as large. This is the entrance port here in the garage. You come in under this sweeping roof here. There's one of the big issues here was to give Jack a port to share and he has a dot so I, I still can't figure out why. <laughs> you know, it's old. It's like 20 years old. He says it's a good car. <laughs> but what he likes to do, and I saw this in Philadelphia, and he brings the car down to Florida, is he likes to park outside. But he doesn't like to get wet. So we had to design this kind of entrance port. He likes to park his car outside, leave the keys in the car running, and go inside, and he'll stay for hours. <laughs> but there are times when he wants to know that he can run out and get away. So, so that was an important part of the project. The other thing that was important was that Annette likes to have parties, and she likes to have big parties. So what we had to do is design a series of elements that would accommodate to our parties. And she kept on saying, hey, is that going to fit enough tables? So we designed this sort of outdoor garden space. And this is a, this actually got cut. But um, out in the rear, you can see in this two slides, here, 
Uh, there's enough space to accommodate parties for up to many people are more here than you think. This shows the public side, the side view of this open space, the pool in there, and the rooms, which are fragmented. And this is a skylight over the stair, which brings you up to the next bedroom, which is like love, and then a study there. Hardly any guest rooms. They have a lot of kids. I never knew they had four children until recently. They never seemed to talk about kids. But they, and Ned said to me, I said, well, where are the kids going to sleep? She said, oh, they can sleep on sofas in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so she's brought back the French decorator, and he's designing those right now. <laughs> okay, look, well, I know you probably know this guy, Ray Orbach. He used to be here at UCLA, and then he became the chancellor of UC Riverside. And he's a very jovial guy who is actually in a lot of energy and is very excited about architecture. Now, in some ways, Ray is a little similar to Fred Wiseman because he likes to think of himself as a patron of the arts. And when we were interviewed to do this project, which is the School of the Arts at UC Riverside, um, he was very much engaged in the process. Now, this is very um, interesting project and, and fairly unique because it provides many disciplines. It provides theater arts and music and dance and writing and uh, sculpture and painting and art history. And all of these facilities or, or particular fields were supposed to, or you know, in Ray's idea, you know, Ray's vision was were to be housed under one roof. But he felt it should be a complex roof. And of course, we agreed with him, and the, uh, the uh, user groups agreed too. You know, try working with them. Well, they were incredibly delightful people to work with because they wanted an exciting building, and Ray wanted to give them an exciting building, and that's what we're working on doing at the moment. The site here is an entrance. It shows an entrance. This is University Avenue that takes you into the campus. Our site sits here. There is a walk over that takes you over the freeway to a new housing area of the campus here. And a large physical element, which is an arroyo, which sits on the other side of the University Avenue, is the arroyo that inspired us when we started thinking about the project. We did a competition, and we beat out Eisenman, even though he said he could be cheaper than us. <coughs> I have to throw that in. Uh, the site is here, and we showed them a series of schemes. And this is the scheme that actually influenced most of our work. It was a building with a giant roof that became a garden and became something that reflected the arroyo across the way. Arroyo, which is a great dried up riverbed and has a kind of status of a, as a, of a historic landmark. What we tried to do is we tried to create a building which would give the university what it needed, which is a series of theaters and other facilities, but also create a focus on the campus which would give the campus a new identity. Have you ever been there? It's very ugly. <laughs> it has all these um, Carrera buildings. Not to put Carrera down, but the buildings are really, really ugly. And the client, you know, Ray, not as much as the user groups, kept on saying, you know, this campus is horrible. You've got to give us something that's going to, in fact, change and modify the look of UC Riverside and, and really make us feel proud that we're here. Now, that's a great client. So we developed a, a process, and I'm not going to show all the schemes. We did maybe five or six different schemes, and they kept on saying, we want something more radical. <laughs> I mean, we like that first image you showed us. Now, you know, very excited about a client who wants to do something radical. This shows the Arroyo, the entrance into campus with this circle, which we all hate. And the building here, which it's adjacent to uh, Caesar Kelly's new building, which is going up, and the administration offices for the chance to work. And the idea of this building is to a building you can walk on, a building in which the landscape elements and the open spaces uh, become as important as the volumes themselves which contain the classrooms, and the theaters, gallery spaces, and the work area. Now, there are certain details that you see in these plans. For example, this corridor, which is kind of jogging back and forth, 
uh, that grew out of dialogue with the chancellor. Getting back to Ray, Ray has an idea, and I think it's a good one, that Carter's in, in um, school rooms, or in school, in school buildings, should in fact not be dead-ended and shouldn't just be long medicinal corridors. To be a fragment, so we developed a, a you know plan that does that, in which the corridors dag and create spaces where people can sit on the floor or where there's enough room to have a table and some chairs, and you can create dialogue as a result of that, especially in a building which is so interdisciplinary. We have so many different groups of people working and, and studying, you want that opportunity. And that was something that grew out of dialogue with, with the chancellor, who remarkable. This shows the uh, step terraces which lead to a courtyard, this is the black box, this is one of the large theaters here, and there's dance hall, dance theaters over on this, this side, which pull out and look out towards the great um, green area, the Corellian Mall. And then the rear of the building, which is a series of classrooms and studios with the visual arts the section through the building. Um, we wanted the building, and that was one of the things that Annie was very much interested in, is, is creating a, a, a variety in the section as well as in plan, and giving the building a sense of being a giant house rather than an institutional building. But it's also a house that, as I said, engages itself into its site and deals with the open spaces as much, with as much importance as the built bodies. So it's something we tell a lot of students all the time. <laughs> this shows the uh, roof plan, the roofscape, uh, a lower courtyard here, then a terrace or upper courtyard here, the black box, the larger uh, music hall here. This background space contains studios, and then these are theaters for dance, pull out, finger out towards the campus here. I think that these model photographs show the building in terms of how we feel it ought to exist material wise as well as volume. It's going to be a stucco and concrete building that will be very, um, hopefully, anthropomorphic in its building. This shows the terrace leading up, black box, the kind of recital hall with its roof hanging over. This is the, uh, these are the, the dance theaters. More views the model. A view that makes the building feel like a giant house. Low house. And then that's me having my hair cut. I used to have long hair. And this is the first house I ever designed. And it was uh, it still exists, and the clients are really good friends. I spoke to Ida Snell, she was a, she was the nurse camp I went to. And um, her husband, he's a doctor, and I spoke to her a couple weeks ago, and they love this house. This house is incredibly important. This house was built in 1971 for $25 a foot. I don't do that anymore. And it's cedar. And one day, I went for the weekend, and I took a friend, that's Rick Gillette, and this is me sitting on the roof. There's a roof terrace here, having my hair cut. I'm listening to music. He's cutting my hair. Now, he was a very young um, successful hair and makeup artist when I met him. Now he's a photographer in New York. And he had just come back from, from Mexico. He had done a job with Lauren Hutton and the Tims uh, in Mexico. And they had worked around Louis Farragut's work. And Rick had never been familiar with Farragut's work. And he called me up one day and he said, I need to change my life. He was living on Park Avenue. He said, I need to move downtown. This was in the uh, 70s, and people were beginning to move downtown. And so I found a place, and I'm going to move downtown, and I want you to do it. So after I finished this house, I went off and lived in Europe for a while, and I came back, and Rick was, uh, became a great patron. 
gave us the opportunity to do this law space. It sits in a building in Lower Manhattan called the Liberty Tower. And as you can see, the palette and the feeling of it is much like some of the work of Berrigan. It's really a Rick's input. Rick chose the colors. He got down on the floor one day, and he mixed pigment made from eye makeup, you know, blue eye makeup, like two girls working by it, you know. And he mixed it into polyurethane, and we battered the floor and made it look uh, two other shots, one which is kind of very referential to Barrett and the, and the pool, which spills over and is recirculated, the water is recirculated. And uh, this dressing area. People up in loft, and one day we got a call from a gentleman who I'd always admired who was <coughs> trying to put together a movie project. He said, I hear you've done an incredible loft. I want to come down and see if I can use it in a film. And it was this guy. And that's Bob Altman. Recently, he lost a lot of weight. He used to, uh, used to like the Bob when I knew him and worked with him. Now he's taking good care of himself. And this is him in a project that we were very fortunate to do for him. I met uh, through Joe Wilder and Joel Gray, who were two clients of mine. And he came down and looked at Rick's place, and he was just completely in shock. He loved it so much. And he said to me, you know, my wife and I have just bought this horrible condo in Malibu. We have to sell our house. You know, I'm not making any money on the other Getting screwed by Hollywood. Screwed by Hollywood. Now he's not screwed by Hollywood anymore. She's very well known. And he said, and we want to do something, and I'd like to do a law. And it was an ugly condominium with no redeeming features. We had our first meeting, and at the first meeting, he presented a model. Now, that's pretty rare when you a client. <laughs> You're the one who's supposed to do that. <laughs> and it was done, it was a model he built with his son, Matthew. And what it did was it gutted the whole building, it opened it up created kind of a wall-like feeling. He said, do you think you can do this? Well, it was something that I found and accepted as a challenge, even though it wasn't easy because it was structural, especially in the building. We proceeded to do it, and he still lives there. He moved back to his big house in his colony, but he lived there he loved it. He also lives in New York and Paris, but it's not a bad life. We created this giant light well, which contains a stair and a bridge which connects a series of bedrooms. Uh, we developed a, with Bob a, a kind of attitude about materials. This is why I have a concrete with, with a fossilized fish embedded in it. It was a fish that we found in the St. Bart's one, one winter. And we created a series of skylights so that the building feels as if it's sometimes you're outdoors even though you're not. And it's giant trans and women. Now we work. And then we create an area for his wife because she does all the cooking and she sits in, in front of his desk and talks on the phone all day and designs furniture and, and um, that opens up to that large space. So the idea here was to make a place which is loft like and feeling and in which all the rooms open up to one another finally. And there is a sense of interchange and community which Bob wanted to create. And it's still there and it's still very much a part of their lives and they like it. Okay, I'm just I'm going to end this talk with a slide of two lost, a lost client and a lost project. This is David Klombeck, and he isn't with us any longer. And he hired us. Uh, he hired me, we met at a party. And he said to me, you know, I bought this little house right here in the Hollywood Hills. And I have this affinity for Mallee Stevens. In fact, David was a great collector of Mallee Stevens. He had beautiful drawings and pieces of furniture. And he even owned an uh, apartment in a building that had been designed by Mallee Stevens in Paris. And he said to me, do you think you can do it? And we went through a series of many, many schemes because it was hard for me to do this project. 
and it was a project that developed through a careful dialogue with uh, David and Dick, his, his uh, roommate. And what we tried to do was to design a building which was, in fact, and would have been, in fact, a background for his collection of Kelly Stevens. And he was an awesome client because he had great opinions. And one day he said to me, this was after we designed five schemes, he said to me, you must be a nervous wreck. You know, I must be like the worst client you ever had, you know, sending it back every time. And I said, no, I'm learning from it. And the process in terms of the development of a project, which the client ultimately, in this case, was very evident, felt very happy and felt as if the building could function the way he had imagined it be both in terms of its workability and its style, um, provided us with a lot of satisfaction. And I dedicate this talk to David. Thank you. Has influenced uh, worked with when I was a fellow with 
the American Academy of Romans. He spent a lot of time with Peter Carl, and I think he's he probably know who he is. He teaches at uh, Cambridge University in England. And he's brilliant. He's an incredible teacher, and he's a great talent. He's one of the most talented people I've ever met, but he's chosen not to build. He doesn't want to build. He wants to teach, to write, to explore. And I learned a lot from my time with Peter Carl that had an impact on me. Another question? Yeah, you talk a lot about dialogue. At your first meeting, do you have an agenda, a process? Uh, what's that first meeting? What's the dialogue like? Well, the first dialogue? meeting is always trying to find out whether you like them and they like you, you know, the client. It's all about, you know, it's touchy-feely kind of thing. And, um, you know, it, and we don't do, you know, there's, there's, you know, the whole process of working with clients is so uh, uh, individual and personal. You know, Charles Moore used to, you know, has done things, when, if you've ever studied the process he went through with the church and those clients, and that's a fascinating study um, in terms of engaging them in the making of the architecture, and it was a brilliant collaboration. Um, what we try to do is, 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 is figure out what the project's about and get to know the client and let them feel as comfortable with us as possible if, of course, you need someone you don't want to work with. Is there or not? <laughs> so then we charge you lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another question? Hey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>